uh, the passing of Jesus according to them, right? So even the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, for example, even the Church of the Nativity, 100% has no authenticity. In fact, there's not even one, two, three, sometimes four locations where they say this happened, but this one is the most famous. But there's other four churches, for example, where they say Jesus was ascended to the sky from the Mountain of Olives. They say this is the Church of the Ascension, but there's four other churches on the same mountain. To different denominations of Christianity. Whereas us for Alhamdulillah, there are places where we have tawatu, meaning certainty that this location is exactly where that happened because it's narrated from scholars with chains of narration from us all the way to the Prophet and there's places where we have ghalabat al meaning this is where scholars of history narrated where this occurred happened and obviously there's other things where they're weak or sometimes started so we have a system in place in Islam alhamdulillah so we're going to walk through this tour, inshallah, to walk you through the life of the Prophet Sallallahu in some of the locations where some of these events took place. And the first place is, as one brother was asking, Shaykh, where are we going? I said, we're going to be there very soon. Somebody said, aren't we outside of Medina in the time of the Prophet Well, now we're going to find out. So what's in front of you right here, behind these gates? It's a nice garden. Exactly. This was a garden from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it remains a garden to this day. This right here. The Prophet used to come to this exact garden to kind of relax and chill with his companions. And as you know, it gets very hot here during the day, so the Prophet would come here and rest. And there was a well that was in this garden. We don't know where the well is anymore. But obviously, this garden remains a garden to this day, as you can see. Now, obviously, these trees are not 1400 years old, right? These are the great great grandchildren of those trees, maybe. Allah Alam. And this area was known to be obviously much bigger. But this portion of it has been preserved. And this area belonged to the Khazraj tribe of Banu Sa'id. <coughs> and it belonged to the companion known as Sa'id ibn Ubad. This has been preserved throughout time. And there is something that happened here very significant in the in Islamic history. <coughs> After the Prophet had passed away, the Ansar gathered here to pick who the next leader of the Muslims would be in this exact garden. Now they thought because they were the citizens of Medina, they get to choose. They said, obviously we have the right to choose. So they came and gathered here and they were discussing amongst themselves how they would choose the next leader. So the Muhajireen, who were the oldest Sahaba with the Prophet Wasallam, the one who were the most senior, the one who had accepted Islam first, they sent a delegation of three. Abu Ubaid Amr ibn Darrah, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Umar ibn Khattab. And they came into this exact garden. So when they came to this garden, known as Saqifat Bani Sa'id, the garden of Banu Sa'id, when they came here, they found the Ansar gathered. And Umar anhu started hearing from them what their process would be to choose the next leader, and he got up to speak. And, and Abu Bakr anhu, when he saw that, he said, Umar, sit down. Because when Umar gets up, somebody's going to get hurt. Something's going to happen when Umar gets up, right? So Abu Bakr anhu, told him, sit down, Umar, let me speak. Because it's a very sensitive issue that has to do with leadership. And Abu Bakr wanted to be very sensitive with the, with the issue. So the first thing he did is obviously is praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sent Allah salam upon the Prophet sallallahu And then he gave one of the most powerful speeches. And he started to praise these people. He said, you people, you Ansar, gave us refuge. You opened your homes. You quite literally gave the clothes off of your back. You gave the, plute, uh, the, uh, the food off of your plate. You took us in. And the Prophet ﷺ in his final speech, the final khutbah that he would ever give to the Ummah on the member of the Prophet ﷺ, towards the end of his days when he was sick, the Prophet ﷺ has said in that speech about you all, that I am from the Ansar and the Ansar are from me. They took us in, they gave us refuge, they protected us. So take care of the Ansar and overlook their mistakes. And he said, but, now, subhanAllah, this is a beautiful way of giving advice. Abu Bakr al first started praising them for the good that they have and what they have done, and then he's going to give the advice. So similarly, when you're about to give advice to somebody, don't say, hey, what's wrong with you? And just start railing. Rather, praise them for the good that they have, and then give the advice. So he said, but, antum al wa nahnu al you people, the Prophet ﷺ has said about you all, you are the ministers, you are the advisors, and we, the, uh, the Quraysh, are the leaders. This is the statement of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, I don't know anyone that is more deserving of being leader over 
the Muslim Ummah than one of these two people. Either Abu Ubaidah Amr ibn Jarrah or Umar ibn Khattab. So you pick whoever you want and he sits down. So then the Ansar speak. And they said, fine, a leader from you all and a leader from us. And then Umar got up. He said, no Allah, no. You all know, every single one of us here, that Sayyiduna wa Afdaluna wa Habbu ila Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam minna huwa Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. That our master, our leader, and the most beloved to the Prophet sallallahu <coughs> and the one who's the best of us, is none other than Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. You all know that. And they all were quiet. And he said, in fact, the Prophet sallallahu has said in his final speech, that same speech, at the end of his speech, I want you to imagine this. The Prophet ﷺ has said, I have paid back every single person in my ummah for what they have given. Everyone who would donate money, when there would be money come to the treasury, the Prophet ﷺ would pay them back or give them land. Or if they made dua, the Prophet ﷺ made dua for them. And for all of us, the Prophet ﷺ has already paid you back. He does not owe you anything. How did the Prophet ﷺ pay us all back? Oh, the Prophet ﷺ will give his intercession to the Muslims on the Day of Judgment. His shafa'a for every single one of you. So the Prophet already has paid us all back. No one has anything on Rasulullah. He said, I have paid everyone back except one man who has sacrificed his body, his wealth, and his, his uh, property, and his family, and I, have, I will never be able to pay him back for what he has sacrificed. And that man is Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And I want you to imagine this. When you go to the Rawda, when the ladies are like taken in this interesting fashion, right? To the Rawda, when you enter the old masjid, Abu Bakr was sitting right at the end. Abu Bakr was sitting at the end of the masjid. So as you pass by and you enter from the back, imagine Abu Bakr sitting there. So Abu Bakr was sitting there and he listened to this. When he heard this from the Prophet, Abu Bakr started to cry and weep. And he did not start crying because the Prophet ﷺ praised him. But he started crying because he knew Rasulullah ﷺ so well. He knew that these words were farewell from the Prophet. ﷺ. This was among the final speech of Rasulullah. ﷺ. And the only person who got it, who wasn't in shock, who, who knew the Prophet ﷺ so well, and he understood from his speech that this is farewell speech, Abu Bakr ﷺ started to weep. He started to cry. And then he started to say, Bal nafdika bi abaina wa mahatina ya Rasulullah. Rather, Ya Rasulullah, if we could, we would also sacrifice our own mothers and fathers for you. Like that's not enough. We would even give up our family for ransom for your sake. And he was crying. And the Prophet has said, Ala rislika Aba Bakr. Like calm down, Abu Bakr. Don't cause panic, don't cause chaos. Because the Prophet knew that Abu Bakr knew what he was saying. And Umar reminded them of this here. And then he said, give me your hand, Abu Bakr. Give me your hand. <laughs> give me your hand, Abu Bakr. I give you my pledge as Khalifa to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this exact garden here. So this is where Abu Bakr was chosen as Khalifa, the successor of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this garden, in this area here. And I want you to imagine, inshallah, this entire garden full of Sahaba. They all got up and one by one they gave their hands to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and they elected him and chose him as Khalifa to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in this area right here. Now, this area by the way opens. It opens in the morning uh, after about 8.39 o'clock. So if you want to come here tomorrow, you can actually come there and step inside, take pictures and just kind of take it in. The Prophet used to visit here and Abu Bakr al-Dilan was chosen Khalifa in this area. So. This is very beautiful. Now, one thing about this. They chose their leader before they even buried Rasulullah This happened the second day the Prophet was buried on after this. When the Prophet passed away, <laughs> the first day they were busy washing the body of the Prophet Then they had to decide who was going to be the Imam over the Janazah of Rasulullah The Imam over his burial and his, his, his uh, prayer over his body and no one had the heart no one had the guts, the audacity the jur'ah to be imam over Rasulullah so they decided that every single person in Medina at the time 
will pray individually over the body of the Prophet. So every man, woman, and child lined up outside the home of Aisha radiallahu And they took their turn one by one, taking their time, walking into that house <coughs> and praying over the body of the Prophet sallallahu and seeing their beloved for the final time. And I want you to just understand how powerful that moment is. This is the most beloved person to them. And now they see him lifeless in front of them. And every person got their time. And at that time, roughly the population of Medina was 10 to 12,000. So you're talking about 10 to 12,000 people taking their time one by one, one by one, men, women, and children. And the extent before this, a woman who was a close friend to Aisha and Ibn Jawzi mentioned this in Sifat the Safwa. He says that this woman who was close friends with Aisha radiallahu said that, Ya Aisha, can I please see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa one more time? So she said yes. She welcomed her in and she pulled the sheet off of the face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And this woman, just out of the sheer sadness, she died. She died on the spot. And this is not the only one. There's narrations of people going blind even. Out, out of the sadness of the Prophet Sallallahu passing. In fact, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi says that the greatest calamity that befall the Ummah will be my death. So remember my death. Anything that you see in your life or anything that you see from amongst the Muslims that happened, the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the greatest calamity. So while that was going on, it took them two days for them to complete. And they chose their leader here. Now what? That's the first reason. What's the second reason that they chose their leader before they even buried the most beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? That is that they understood the importance of central authority. They understood the importance of central authority. What does that mean? The first commandment in the Quran is to believe in Allah and to worship Him. Then the five pillars of Islam and the six pillars of Iman, right? What's the very first commandment after that? After you're Muslim, five pillars, six pillars of faith, What's the very first commandment in the Quran? Huh? I can't hear. Follow? Follow the leaders. The leader Follow the, the leaders. Leader. Who are the leaders? Who are the leaders? Who are they? No. Yes, good. Huh? What is it? Yeah, good. It's the verse in the Quran. Excellent. You have 6,000 choices now. Just hold on. It's not the first thing. You've already accepted Islam. You're obeying Allah and you're obeying His message. Uh, uh. Ah. Uh, you, get, you forbid the evil, command the good. How can you do that when you don't know? You already told me no, Billah. You already believe in Allah. Ah. Khalifa? <coughs> no. That's not the first thing. The Prophet says that um, follow the whoever lead you um, <coughs> after me like the Good, Quran, sort of, but you're like going around it. Before you can follow somebody, you have to have something else. Huh? Can I call a friend? Huh? Can, I call a friend? can you call a friend? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Call a friend. Uh, huh? like, um, four groups of people mentioned in to those who are anam ta'alayhim from those. Is that the four groups? No. I didn't think so. Ah, do we know? Give us a hand, sir. Okay, good. This is where you say, I don't know. I don't know. Good. Yes. <laughs> the first commandment in the Quran, after you have established your faith, you believe in Allah, all of that. Ask people of knowledge if you don't know. How are you going to learn? How are you going to establish the commandments? How are you going to follow leadership if you don't know? And the only way you will know is you ask people who know. Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. Meaning, don't take Sheikh Google and Mufti YouTube as your Islam. They're good forms of education, don't get me wrong. But Islam is transmitted in its application, teacher to student, one-on-one. -on -one. You have to have someone in front of you to run things by, to ask questions, to make sure that your Islam is understood in its proper context. That you're not figuring things out on your own. There's a process in Islam, even the Prophet ﷺ had you here. Even Musa, a prophet, has khadr. This is a process in our faith that is in, engraved in the Quran. You have to have a personal relationship with someone that you can run by and ask questions, 
so that you can understand your Islam in its proper context and it's a proper application. Otherwise, you will see the lunacy that you see right now in the Ummah, where people are detached from having teachers who they can run things by and guide them, and then they go completely insane. And they do lunatic things. This is what they understood, that they chose their leader, Abu Bakr before they even buried Rasulullah This is how powerful that message is. So the question to all of us here, is do you have that one person or two people that you can actually have access to and you ask questions and you run things by and you make sure that you ask or you don't? So if you don't, you have to fight. If you don't, you have to fight. Islam can never be detached from its umbilical cord and that is scholarship. And this scholarship, it goes direct chain to the Prophet Anyone who has studied without this, be afraid of their scholarship. All scholarship has gone through this process. All scholarship in the history of the Ummah. And anytime there's been an anomaly, crazy things have happened with these issues. So make sure that you all seek your central authority, just like the Sahaba knew to take their own central authority in this exact place. So tomorrow, in fact, you guys can come here whenever you're free in the morning, inshallah, and actually go into this garden and take. Uh, take pictures if you like and just enjoy the company and again like we said this garden was much bigger this belonged to the Khazraj tribe of the Ansar there's also a sign here you're welcome to take pictures of where it gives you more information this is one of the few things that the Saudi uh, government has preserved alhamdulillah from the time of the Prophet so you can actually see, see and this used to be outside of the Medina no so when we say Medina the Prophet the city is roughly the marble area and the green gate we mean roughly so this was the edge of the city of the Prophet and there were still villages all around. So roughly in the marble area, not by exact. Not by exactly. Yeah. And I'll tell you, we're going to go to another place that was in Medina that's outside of the Green Gate right now.